I wanted to begin tonight uh, by establishing a little bit of a genealogy. This is a poem by my hero, mentor, and I am proud to say somewhat of a friend, uh, Tom Gunn, whose new book is out now. You should all go buy it immediately. It's called Boss Cupid. My friend Russell posed for the cover. A cute little skinhead. And this is a poem about uh, his own mentor, uh, the quasi-beat Black Mountain poet Robert Duncan, simply called Duncan. When in his twenties, a poetry's full strength burst into voice as an unstopping flood, he let the divine prompting come at length, rushingly bear him any way it would, and went on writing, while the ferry turned from San Francisco, back from Berkeley too, and back again, and back again. He learned, you add to, you don't cancel what you do. Between the notebook margins, his pen traveled, his own lines carrying him in a new mode to ports in which past purposes unraveled. So that, as on the ferry line he rode, whatever his first plans might have been, that energy ero that arose from their confusion became the changing passage lived within while the pen wrote and looked beyond conclusion. Forty years later, and both kidneys gone, every eight hours, home dialysis, the habit of his restlessness stayed on, exhausting him with his responsiveness. After the circulations of one day, in which he taught a three-hour seminar, then gave a reading clear across the bay, and while returning from it to the car with plunging, hovering tread, tired and unsteady, down Wheeler's steps, he faltered and he fell. Fell, said later, as, I, as if I stood ready, into the strong arms of Tom Gunn. Well, well. The image comic, as I might have known, and generous, but it turned things round to myth. He fell across the white steps there alone, though it was me indeed that he was with. I hadn't caught him, hadn't seen in time, and picked him up from where he had softly dropped a pillow full of feathers. Was it a rhyme he later sought in which he might adopt the role of H.D., broken-hipped and old, who, as she moved off from the reading stand, had stumbled on the platform, but was held and steadied by another poet's hand. He was now a posthumous poet, I have said, for since his illness he had not composed, in sight of a conclusion whose great dread was closure, his life soon to be enclosed like the sparrow's flight above the feasting friends, briefly revealed where its breast caught the light, beneath the long roof, between open ends, themselves the margin of unchanging night. <coughs> the other one is a poem by Duncan himself. It's kind of a homecoming poem. Often I am permitted to return to a meadow as if it were a scene made up by the mind that is not mine, but is a made place that is mine. It is so near to the heart an eternal pasture folded in all thought so that there is a hole therein, created by light where from the shadows that our forms fall. Where from fall all architectures I am, I say are likenesses of the first beloved, whose flowers are flames lit to the lady. She it is, queen under the hill, whose hosts are a disturbance of words within words that is a field folded. It is only a dream of the grass blowing east against the source of the sun in an hour before the sun's going down, whose secret we see in a children's game of ring around of roses told. Often I am permitted to return to a meadow as if it were a given property of the mind that certain bounds hold against chaos. That is a place of first permission, everlasting omen of what is. It's important to keep hydrated. <laughs> Um, I want to read uh, some poems from my first book, and if there's time, perhaps do some new stuff. But since a lot of you haven't heard the first ones already, I figure I'll stick with those for the most part. If you cannot hear, there's tons of room down on the floor, and I promise not to spit on you. Um, Natasha was very gracious to invite me to read. was also very gracious to provide muscles for dinner. So in honor of that, I'm going to do a couple of, well, 
muscle poems. I suppose they're really torturing seafood poems, but so it goes. The power grip. Out of the blue he calls to report our mutual friend has just dumped her lover of seven years. And why? Because he hit her. More than once? She says it's gone on since they started going out. She never breathed a word. Maybe she was afraid of what we'd think. Maybe she thought he'd stop. Me, I suspect the worst of everyone. I bet the sex was great. I bet he gave good head. This should, I know, make me upset. But the receiver is round and warm and is an exact fit to my ear, the voice that fills it. So easy to get used to the liberties he takes, the indiscretions of age, skill, seasoning. Men don't talk enough about fucking, he told me once and leaned closer across our table in the bar's dark corner, tip of his middle finger wet, tracing obscure designs in a pool of spilled beer. Think of the slack we'd pick up if we just sat down, knocked back a few drinks, and compared notes. His notes were by far the more exhaustive. He did all the talking. With the connoisseur's attachment to the part, spare of the whole, the way bodies may be compounded, spread out and open, made to grow loose, to spasm, the soft parts map, the joints, their degrees of sympathy, all the while putting fresh drinks into my hand, keeping up the low murmur, seamless, fluid as Latin mass, its litany, go down on her, go down on her again, practice in case of emergency, the power grip. The what? <laughs> he held his hands pressed to his face, index and little fingers thrust up, pressed together, thumbs enticingly open. Pinkies tickle the ass, pointers spread the lips, thumbs for a chin rest. <laughs> and then, as now, not knowing what or if to say, <laughs> struck dumb made all into one open ear. Someday I'll get a call, sometime after the fact, a relative, a friend, perhaps the woman whose last bruises are fading as we speak, who won't make the same mistake again, but more likely someone who knows only my rank in his Rolodex. He passed away last week. When I ask how, a silence long enough to suggest in what poor taste the question is. Not knowing is worse than what I can imagine. He died of eating raw mussels, the ones he freely harvested from the black rocks on the cleaner stretch of coast upcurrent from the harbor. He'd been warned time and again by beachcombers, by stray marine biologists, by the diehard fishermen whose poles he found wedged between the larger pebbles, been lectured on dioxin and red tide, been sick two times already, the second nearly died. Perhaps instead, tipping a scrubbed clipped shell between his lips, he breathed the wrong way, stifled on fringed orange flesh. I watched him once lie belly down on the steep pitch of a boulder, boots locked between the rocks, freeing his arms to plunge, now to the elbow, now up to the shoulder, in a tide pool where he knew the muscles grew thickest, their fractal clusters dark as new bruises. Shells liable to chip, and once chipped, the insides quick to rot. A blunt butter knife in his left hand, the right sounding blind below the surface. Contours of curve, crevice, valve. Perhaps he slipped in headlong, struck rock, was dragged out of the brine too late, or not at all. His body left to slowly evanesce. The blueprint for bouillabaisse never trusted to paper in 20 generations. The thin layer of man between the brain that held it, the salt broth that stocked it, now dissolved. All that's left is the power grip. A secret handshake. The device of an old cult. A rite not softened by long use, by cultivation, of which I've now been made receptacle. Scrubbing muscles. 
easy at first to think they're all alike. But in the time it takes your brush to scour away the cement their beards secrete to stick to the rock, to one another, you'll find the lure of intimacy a temptation. Palm cupping each shell, you learn a history from what you scrape off. Limpets, worm castings, their own brown crust, what company they've kept, how many neighbors on the fringes or in the thick. This patriarchal shell suffered a near fatal crack. Hinges skewed by a scab, its valves will never seal perfectly, ever. This one lost the chip of its carapace, the nacre gleams, steel plate in a war veteran's skull. Here's a couple tangled by their beards, but do they mate? You can't remember how they reproduce. Now and then you'll find one open, startle, fling it aside, your fingers come too close to what you hoped would stay hidden, the veil lining the shell, flushed pink, not orange, no, not yet. Once they are clean and more or less alike, they're ready to arrange in a skillet, large enough for a single layer, <coughs> with chopped onions and garlic, maybe a pinch of tarragon, no salt, they will provide the salt themselves, butter, an inch or so, of dry white wine. Replace the lid, turn on and light the gas. Make sure the match is thoroughly stubbed out. If you've been tempted at any point to see in them an image of yourself, you must make sure your mind is emptied of all such madness. <coughs> Muscles cannot mind the slowly warming pan, the steam, or feel real pain, which requires sympathy, a kind of tenderness. The worst, most capable monsters admit a feeling for the flesh they brutalize. The inquisitors who cry with the heretic they rack for a confession. The kind cop who stops the third degree to offer coffee, a smoke. The death camp doctor who celebrates a patient's birthday, slips him an extra piece of bread. All sympathetic men. Think how delicious they will be. The shells relaxing, giving up their humble secrets, their self-possession. Your demands are not so cruel. Don't follow their example. Slice the lemon. Make sure to wash your hands. Saffron. The recipe is written in your voice. Saute the rice to the color of a pearl in oil flavored with pepper, cinnamon bark, bay leaf, and cardamom, the small green kind. Simmer until the spices have all floated up to the top. If you want to, pick them out. Just before it's done, stir in the saffron, crumbled and soaked in milk. Such frail red threads, odd how they bleed so yellow, so contrary to what a purple flower's genitals should look like. It was in a dirt poor dive somewhere in Spain that I had my first taste of paella. How anything could cost so much I couldn't bring myself to believe until you <coughs> took me out into the fields, the ragged sweeps of autumn crocuses. Not like the ones I've seen breaking the frost, clumps of three or four with a forced cheer of things made to wake up too early. These were a paler purple, less audacious. The harvesters were children, mostly girls, working their way in no special pattern from bloom to bloom. One of them let me plunge my hand up to the wrist in what she'd gathered. They felt like birds' tongues sticking to my skin, spotted with pollen, limp, bruised, and damp, with no smell to speak of. That handful dried would not have covered my fingernail and that from a whole acre. Maybe it ended up in your kitchen, in one of the many dishes you taught me how to make, in which we never ate more than half of. Our tongues couldn't absorb that much, so dense and yet so delicate. We dulled the taste with smoke, knocking the ashes into the champagne flutes you'd shipped back from Murano on our way up to bed. <coughs> there can't be that much saffron in the world, as if to think it passed through my hands twice would make it all appear less of a waste. 
that wild, endlessly nuanced fugue of flavor, so much variety, so much to spend. Later, at the end, when I asked you what you wanted, if it wasn't me, you smashed the dark brown vial across the counter, swept spice and glass into your hand, and said, this is my gold standard, my one measure of value, the smell of money burning. Anything more expensive would be illegal. I couldn't even begin to afford your taste. My fingers, stained gold with its dirty sting, still looked to me like those of a small brown hand, drifting across a field, spreading the petals, the womb pinched out like an unsightly hair, a thousand times, a thousand times over, all for a fleeting pungency, a touch of yellow, all to prove how much attention you command. This one's for Joel. In answer to a question he posed earlier. Locker room etiquette. <laughs> Please refrain from frankly ogling your neighbor's penis or buttocks. This goes without saying. Bear, however, that the simplest courtesy often is the first forgotten. Likewise, the appraising sidelong gaze, however surreptitious, seldom fails to offend when it is noticed. Wandering eyes are best averted. The small talk that in other awkward situations would ease the moment, here you should avoid addressing to strangers, <coughs> even familiar faces who often find it quite disarming. This is neither the time nor place for idle chit chat or to broach uncertain topics. Keep to the distance run, the merits of this or that equipment, warm-ups, weights, ra heart rates, reps, soreness of muscles. Comments, however, on your own or your fellow's sweaty aroma rarely are welcomed. Modesty and its overbalance in this respect are equal, drawing too much attention. Take, as an example, running the gauntlet locker to shower, a source of so much worry. Should one promenade the flower of manhood fearlessly down the hall, or wear one's towel prudishly knotted over the flanks, only to find it twirling down to the ankles, forcing one to postures neither becoming nor graceful to retrieve it? <laughs> Strive for a balance. Walk at a steady clip, the towel loosely draped over the shoulder. If necessary, practice in front of a mirror. <laughs> Where nakedness makes you shy as a hermit crab between shells, or a snail who hides his tremulous horns at the first smell of danger, summon about yourself an impenetrable aura, an armor over which the playful spray of the shower spatters harmlessly. Spare the soap and lather only as much as may fulfill the barest dictates of hygiene, <laughs> lingering nowhere long except the armpits. Also in drying, with an unspecific sweep over crotch, the peach crease of the buttocks. Carry your person stiffly, as if each limb required a heroic effort of will to flex. Your head should never drop below your armpits or only briefly tying your laces. Handle yourself at all times with distasteful resignation, as one regards an oyster slick on the half shell. Maybe it's better not to imagine oysters or snails. Those were bad examples. <laughs> Try to forget them. Reticence in speech as well as action will keep you focused here in the moment, far away from that boy on the bench directly opposite. Yes, the one you've been sitting naked silently beside in the sauna. Stretch your hamstrings. Look at your toenails. Think of how you are pressing more each day. Soon you'll be up to 60, 70, 80 pounds, all up to the weight of nobody watching. <laughs> this is a poem from a series of poems that I would envision to be for dead rock stars, but as I think I, I'd said before at some point, um, a lot of them stubbornly refused to die on me. <laughs> so the series was very short. <laughs> 
I'm holding out for Trent Reznor. He'd make a beautiful corpse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a beautiful man and a beautiful corpse. This is uh, for Jeff Buckley, whom I hope at least some of you will know. Um, died a couple of years ago in a freak drowning accident. Grace, for Jeff Buckley, 1966 to 1997. You were barely 30, and now you've gone and drowned. Walked off a Mississippi River marina in Memphis, clothes and all laughing, washed up at the base of Beale Street by the bars, and you weren't even drunk. Or like your father, found spider clenched up with the needle still sticking. You, who were sweet and smart and beautiful, who bought a hat to teach yourself responsibility, dead by your own wild child-eyed exuberance. The voice has gone forever out of yourself, choked with heart stuck in the throat. Vienna choir boy gone banshee, dive bombing us through thunderheads of swirled together songs. The blues tuned up too tightly, basked what the wound string could stake, snapped, a snake feeding back on its own tail. You sang Luli Lule, Luli Lule, and got away with it. You hallelujahed, made me follow the curve of every note, led me momently to believe. But this you leave to me only, to each of us alone, no us at all. You were a vice as shameful to admit as chastity, as embarrassing to share. Like dogs licking a hurt we listen, womb walled away in our headphones, wiretappers, eavesdropping on the moan, mindful not to breathe too loud, to read our own lips in silence. Now that you're gone, give us the grace to slowly find each other out. The shed skin, the loss of innocence we've been the patron of. The boy who lost his, tossed to one end of a strange bed. The thread drawn out of his body into another's privacy before you lullabied him back to the sad, eroded sleep of the come unraveled. In that husband's side, you were a thorn, tucked into his wife's purse next to the contraceptives. The one abandoned he can't share with her, played out with others. In the dark, in a parked car. Faithless, yes, but less than he. The girl who hounded you from club to club in the front row against the stage each night, grappling the air, straining to claw her fingers through your head of tumbled out of bed brown hair and snare one for a keepsake, a relic. And when at last you yielded between je ne connais pas le fin and last goodbye, groped down in your jeans, pulled out a loose hair and tendered it shyly for her to take. And as for me, when you washed up, I was in the south of France, the troubadour's old stomping ground. And there, in a pink and white church, a stopover along the holy body circuit de Santiago, named for a bishop torn apart by wild horses. There, in a crypt that smells of water dripped through bones, is a triple box of glass, the outermost pavilion, gold, octagonal, to match the church's spire, the second, silver, square, the last, the exact size and shape of a crack vial in which you can barely make out a wisp of bramble, thorn from the thorny crown. I wanted to steal the whole thing, spirit it out of the country, take it home, and under those tiers of glass, one in four in eight, enshrine that single hair and stick the thorn back in my side where it belongs. Hot. <coughs> I'm cooking Thai. You bring the beer. The same order, although it's been a year. Friendships based on food are rarely stable. We should have left ours at the table where it began and went to seed that appetite we shared, based less in need than boredom. Always the cheapest restaurants, Thai, Szechuan, taking our chances with gangs and salmonella. What was hot? The five-starred curries? The penciled out entrees? The first to break a sweat would leave the tip. I raised the knocker, let it fall once, twice, and when the door is opened, I can't absorb at first what's happened. Face loosened a notch, eyes with the gloss of a fever left to run its course too long, letting the unpropped skin collapse in wrinkled heat. Only the lips I recognize, dry, cracked, chapped from licking. He looks as though he slept a week in the same clothes. 
Come in, kick back, he says, putting my warm six-pack of pale and bitter into the fridge to chill. There's no music. I had to sell the stereo to support my Jones, he jokes, <coughs> meaning the glut of good cookbooks that cover one whole wall, stacked milk crates, six high, nine wide, two deep. He grates unripe papaya into a bowl, fires off questions. When did you finish school? Why not? Still single? Why? That dive that served the ginger eels, did it survive? I don't get out much. Should we go sometime? He squeezes the quarters of a lime into the salad, adds a liberal squirt of chili sauce. I won't be hurt if you don't want seconds. It's not as hot as I would like to make it, but you always were a bit of a lightweight. <coughs> Here, it's finished. Try a bite. He holds a forkful of the crisp green shreds for me to taste. I swallow, gasp, choke. Pins and needles shoot through mouth and throat, a heat so absolute as to seem freezing. I know better not to wash it down with ice water. It seems to cool, but only spreads the fire. I can only bite my lip and swear quietly to myself, so caught up in our old routine. What, this is hot? You're sweating. Care for another beer? It doesn't occur to me that he's sincere. Until my eyes watering, half in rage, I open the door and find the fridge stacked full of little jars of curry paste, arranged by color, labels faced carefully outward. Some pushed back to make room for the beer. No milk, no takeout cartons of gelatinous chow mein, no pickles rotting in green brine, not even a jar of moldy mayonnaise. I see you're eating well these days, I snap, pressing the beaded glass of a beer bottle against my face, throat, temples, anywhere it will hurt enough to draw the fire out and divert attention from the fear that follows close behind. <coughs> he stares at me, the hollows under his eyes more prominent than ever. I don't eat much these days. The flavor has gone out of everything, almost. For the first time, it's not a boast. You know those small bird chili pods, the type you wear surgical gloves to chop, then soak your knife in cutting board and vinegar? A month ago, I scored a fresh bag. They were so ripe, I couldn't cut them warm. I had to keep them frozen. I forgot what I had meant to make that night. I just cleaned the kitchen, wanted to fool around with some old recipe I'd lost and found jammed up behind a drawer. I had maybe too much to drink. Can't be that bad. I remember thinking, what's the fuss about? It's not as if they're poisonous. Those peppers, I ate them raw. A big fistful shoved in my mouth and swallowed whole, and more, and more. It wasn't hard. You hear of people getting their eyes charred to cinders, staring into an eclipse. He speaks so quickly, one of his lips is cracked, leaks a trickle of blood along his chin. I never understood. I try to speak, to offer some small, shocked rejoinder, but my mouth is numb, tingling, hurts to move. I called in sick next morning, said I'd like to take time off. She thinks I've hit the bottle. The high those peppers gave me is more subtle. I'm lucid. I remember my full name, my parents' birthdays, how to win a game of chess in seven moves, why which and that mean different things. But what we eat, why, what it means, it's all been explained. Take this curry, this fine-tuned balance of humors, coconut liquor sinned by broth, sour pulp of tamarind cut through by salt, set off by fragrant galangal, ginger, basil, cilantro, mint, the warp and woof of texture, aubergines that barely hold their shape, snap beans heaped on jasmine, basmati rice. It's a lie, all of it, pretext, artifice, ornament, sugar coating for he stops, expressing heat from every pore of his full face, <coughs> unable to give vent to any more, and sits silent a whole minute. You understand? 
course, I tell him. As he takes my hand, I can't help but notice the strength his grip has lost as he lifts it to his lip, presses it for a second. I'd like to again thank Natasha for bringing me, for Joel for reading with me. We'll be back in the band soon. Stay posted. <laughs> Scheherazade. The porch on which we sit and drink red wine is open. Anyone could hear us. We have no secrets, nothing at all to hide. I cross my legs, letting the instep nest the swell of your calf, a pass you take in stride, a first presumption, as if you weren't impressed or not enough to move away. You pause only to take another long drag on the cigarette we are sharing and pick up the thread right where you dropped it, a long yarn of wild high school days. We got so high, the car was filled with smoke. I couldn't say a thing. I guess the cop came by and shined a flashlight in. I thought he'd gone blind. It was all big white fog. <laughs> we took the chance and ran. I stuffed the baggie down my pants, opened the driver's side, and hit the ground running through everyone's backyard around the hedge and ended up at Mike's. His dad and mom were asleep. We jumped into bed, covers over our heads, and couldn't stop giggling. <laughs> <laughs> Half an hour later, the cop came by, woke up Mike's dad, asked if he'd heard anything. He got mad, yelled at the cops, woke up all the neighbors all over again. Each story blurs into the next, and so well unrehearsed. It's easy to forget I'm not the first to hear how your mother beat you with a belt for fooling with a fuse box, how you'd rather be shocked and learn that way by accidents, not design. The drugs, the making out sessions you covered for but never seemed to be invited to. More of the cops' incompetence. The bottle of mint schnapps you dropped in Lisa's jacuzzi, her parents away in Vegas. How you cleaned up, finding smaller and smaller slivers of glass, some with your feet. Because he didn't mind the sight of blood, the idea of injury, you thought you'd be a doctor. How you propped up and kept alive the passed out drunks until they sobered. The obligato of lost and left lovers. One in particular who played guitar in a band. Who took you once out to coffee and then for weeks would park his car all night under your bedroom window. Hang around until the lights went out. Slipped you hot and bothered poems. Harassed you from on stage. Who as the evening goes is starting to sound a lot like me. <laughs> I want to interrupt to say I wouldn't dream of doing that, but then I will have slipped my foot into the shoe that you've unlaced, maybe without suspecting it would fit, or worried that it would, afraid you'd run out of stories, afraid to lose your head, afraid of what you'd learn if you heard mine. I'm afraid too, afraid you'll tell the same story twice. The friend who slit her wrists the wrong direction, the one who wrecked the car you lent and then wouldn't be held accountable. And whether we recognize it instantly or only when the thread has gone too far to wind with any grace back on the spool, will we have been spoiled for good, our trust deflowered? Will I be left unable to pretend I'm any more than a convenient ear, something to drain your excess? Lovers record each other's autobiographies, rehearse them till they slip from one tongue to the other without effort, love's history without plot or meaning, only details. Nothing pairing or pruning doesn't kill. But when I'm at a loss except to say, I like the way the hairs flow on your forearm, fine and dark against the grain of muscle, not along it, there's no history, not then and maybe never that this will start. Only another story. I feel already how your brain snaps shut, flattens me like a box. How you will cut me out with scissors, color me black and pink, sketch in a few features, a big nose, find some scraps of fabric to make me clothes, add me to your ensemble. I should fit in neatly. The stalker and I will start a band. 
join Lisa, who must by now have shriveled into a raisin in a hot tub, pour bottle by bottle her parents' entire liquor cabinet in, get wasted, and invite those boys over to join us, those wallflowers whose new loose-tongued confidence and sass their lovers bless silently. Perhaps I'll find Mike, still where you left him, hiding under the covers. How will I introduce myself? What will I be? The bad idea you caught in time? The closet skeleton? The thing that taught you caution? Or just the melancholy boy who sat out on the porch and drank red wine? Whatever part you write me, I'll be pleased just to be cast, to be considered worth at least a story. However warped or skewed or flattering, wrapped as an infant with a mirror, the same rapture I wish you in this tail-swallowing tale. No more or less true than your idea of my idea of you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.